my talk is about reactive data processing in Python. Um, I, I would like to introduce you to uh, the topic of uh, working with streaming data in a reactive way. So uh, if you're concerned about uh, writing, writing a program which performs some, let's say, machine learning task, um, the, the way you will approach it most probably is to write some code prototype some code, probably using the Python stack with uh, pandas, uh, with some, let's say, classifier, which is used, for, which is trained, which is used for prediction. You'll want to run some experiments for, with it, make sure it's working, and be done with it. Have a coffee. So this is the uh, optimistic uh, version. Uh, the things start to uh, get difficult uh, if you want to go to the streaming world to start handling live data updates. This means essentially redoing all the code logic we started out with in a streaming architecture, which means preparing to handle every imaginable and unimaginable data uh, update scenario. So all this has to be done in conjunction with uh, classification and prediction logic, which was, uh, which was designed previously. And this is not an ideal place to be. Uh, some of the joys of streaming data, well, first of all, data updates are full of surprises. You may start out assuming that uh, we just need to handle new data points as they arrive and we're done with it. But after a while, it turns out uh, that uh, many more update scenarios have to be foreseen. So we have uh, questions like day 77. Hey, could we please update all the data points that have arrived in the last hour? They arrived broken. Somebody entered a feature which was called distance M in miles instead of meters. So we have to update all the data. And what's worse, our models have already got trained on that data. So we will need to unlearn that and learn anew. So this is like point one. Point two. Uh, the world of theming is full of unknown unknowns. So imagine that for the last, let's say, week or longer, your program has been running in streaming mode, uh, taking data in all the time, churning on data that, that has never seen before. Um, as the software developer, you cannot restart it. You cannot easily look inside your program to see what it's actually doing. You're not quite sure what state it is in and how it got there. And today things started to go wrong. And let's say one of our models seems to be misclassifying or at least suspiciously classifying all objects it sees as cow. What do you do now? You cannot look into it exactly. Well, the answer is you cannot do too much. You can hope that perhaps everything you're seeing today is really is cows, uh, but maybe things are very wrong. So this is just point two. Point three is all about data uh, consistency. So suppose we go for something ambitious, we're deploying in production a system which is doing live temperature monitoring for a power plant. And now a number of uh, interesting data points have arrived, the system is processing them. And in the last half minute, the critical alert flag has been flashing on and off, on and off at least a dozen times as the system processes data. Now it seems to be off. So the question is, is it that our system is already done with computing and we can um, sigh with relief? Or do we wait just a minute longer to be on the safe side? And uh, ensuring consistency uh, or not having consistency is one of the bigger pain points in, in stream data processing. So these worries are actually so off-putting that some projects fall back on batch execution, which means they, the architecture which was designed to be running uh, live in streaming nev is never put into place. We say instead, okay, I will, instead of trying to update my uh, program as it is running, I will just rerun every, say, 30 minutes the batch prototype, which I wrote in Pandas, maybe in PySpark, to make it scale a bit better on all the data that we've seen so far. At least this will work. So this is indeed a viable approach in the sense that it's a fallback, which may just possibly work. And here's a checklist of things to check um, if it really does work. So first of all, latency. Will the rerun complete fast enough to meet business needs? In this case, is 30 minutes enough? Secondly, computing cost. So if we do have a chance to rerun within the required latency, say within 30 minutes from scratch, how many cores will it take? It can easily go in thousands of cores. What's the cost of the cloud resources needed to do that? 
Point three, this is an interesting one, reproducibility. So suppose uh, I'm rerunning my machine learning algorithm or my pipeline every 30 minutes. Every time I get subtly different results. They can be subtly different in an unimportant way. For example, all the rows got renumbered and the, last, the next time I look at uh, my outcomes, they're completely different, let's say up to permutation with respect to the previous time. Is this an issue or not? And finally, future proofing. If things run fast enough today, will they be running fast enough in half a year or one year from now? The data will only be becoming bigger as we go along. So this is a checklist of things to look out for before we can actually fall back to a batch processing system. The, the issue, the outcome, the sad realization seems to be that a lot of industrial projects that we see, that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis in enterprise, uh, fail to check at least one box, but nonetheless, uh, they choose to deploy in batch mode, delivering only partial value. So it turns out that the barrier to deliver streaming data projects in production is just too high um, and the tooling is missing. So uh, the industry opts for a second best, losing out on all the value that streaming can offer. So one, one approach which comes to the, the rescue is what we will focus on today, reactive design. The essence of reactive design is to uncouple logic designed by the software developer, or by the developer of a machine learning model from data updates which are going on in the system. As the developer, you focus on describing your logic as you would for a batch system and you let the reactive framework behind the scenes handle all the data stream processing and propagate all changes. So if for anybody who's used a spreadsheet, I guess that means all of us, uh, the separation is pretty clear. If we are programming or coding in a, in a spreadsheet, uh, all we do is define the logic, declare the logic. Let's say we want cell B1 to be the sum of cells A1 and A2, and we put up this rule. And we let the spreadsheet underneath take care of all the data updates that are going on. Let's say if different values are appearing, three, five, two, things are changing, uh, and the, the spreadsheet takes care of this. So for a spreadsheet, we know what this means. Today, uh, my objective will be to explain, to show you what it, this means for a machine learning pipeline and when working specifically in Python, specifically with data frames or tables. So let's start by preparing our first machine learning model reactively. The goal is to show you the proof of concept. So I'm not going to be super original here. Let's start with classifying handwritten digits as a toy example. The twist is that the training data that's coming in is changing over time. We see at every time new digits coming in, new digits uh, with, with labels, uh, so new, new elements of the training set, which is forcing our model to adapt. So clearly I want the model to improve as new training data becomes available. And this uh, described like this, this task is like a bundled uh, mess between uh, classification in the machine learning sense and some kind of uh, data processing, data update processing task because you have training data that's changing over time. Let's take the reactive perspective and see if we can somehow untangle the two issues. And the, the, the way to look at it is like super straightforward. We ask, self, ask ourselves first, is time a feature in the data? Is time a column for us, which is used by the classifier? So here we are looking at classifying handwritten digits. Handwritten digits have nothing to do with time. So the obvious answer is no. This gives us the, the happy path, the easy path, it means that machine learning logic that we design shouldn't be concerned with how the data changes over time. It should just think batch, act as it would in pure batch mode, and let the reactive framework take care of updating the model as data changes. The other scenario, which is not shown here, uh, would be one more adapted to time series. Let's skip it for the moment. 
And here's a classical example in Pathway. Uh, Pathway is a brand new framework, uh, programming framework, uh, which has been tested in enterprise, but which uh, only today has uh, launched in open beta, is made available to all developers. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, publicly announce for the first time code snippets in Pathway. And here's how you would write a classifier for handwritten digits in Pathway. It's basically three lines. Well, you start by importing Pathway. Uh, you uh, can load the training data and the test data that you want to work with. So there's uh, like training uh, data, training labels, test data, and test labels for the sake of verification validation. Uh, we load it, uh, in this case, from a simulated data stream, a data stream uh, of digits, uh, which represents the MNIST data set being streamed. You could connect as well to an external data source. Um, you uh, create a classifier, train a classifier. In this case, we go for k nearest neighbors with uh, LSH, but the details are not so important. Uh, we, we set some parameters. In this case, they're almost like defaults plus dimension parameter. Um, then we uh, set the, uh, the prediction, um, meaning we want uh, the predicted labels to come from the classification using the created classifier on the test data, um, set some further parameters, and that's basically it. There's a final line uh, which allows us to uh, validate and verify accuracy. And what, what you see here looks like a piece of code in Python. It is a piece of code in Python. Uh, the difference being that if we were to execute this sort of code in batch mode, uh, you, and imagine that it's like working in a typical framework, for all the lines here would execute sequentially. They'd just run, they'd produce some results. Working with pathway in streaming mode, in production mode, the outcome is different. The pathway distributed uh, runtime engine puts up or creates a kind of control flow graph uh, which uh, describes the lines that have been written and puts it into place in a streaming framework. So what you see in the lower part of this slide in this image is the control flow graph which has been put into place we can say forever which will churn forever after the lines above have been activated data will be coming in from the input data stream sources and again this may may be, may be something happening perpetually the, the training data will be entering the training of the classifier and will produce the classifier together uh, with uh, the test data that the classifier can be used for prediction to generate the predicted labels. The final line, which is commented out, allows us to validate uh, the accuracy of, uh, of a prediction uh, based on the test labels, which are also available. And essentially, the, if, if you feel that there's no difference between the code you tried to run in batch mode and the code you would write in pathway uh, to deploy in streaming mode, then you, you are right. That's the intention. There's no such visible difference. It's just that the outcome is completely different because in the second mode, in the streaming mode, uh, pathways engine takes care of processing all the data updates. So when a new training uh, element comes in, there's an update to these data streams, which cause an update to the classifier, which may cause an update to outcomes of predictions. And Pathway does it in the most resource efficient way possible, given the implementation, um, doing something known as incremental computation, which means that only a part of the result is recomputed a part of the uh, computations and, and hopefully uh, for this implementation just a very small part of the whole um, of the whole picture is recomputed with every new element of data arriving so this is the uh, the way it works um, if uh, we look at how pathway classifies takes classifying decisions for incoming data so x test in the previous slide was the table of points for which predictions are needed and these predictions uh, will be updated uh, for as long as the trained model changes if we get a better model new elements coming in the predictions will update themselves 
Uh, the, the idea here is that X uh, test for the test set can also be updated uh, when we need to take decisions on a given element on a given data point we insert it into the test set and if we no longer to take uh, need to take decisions we delete it from the test set so to control which decisions should be computed by the system just to roll back one slide we can actually add uh, a pre-processing step or a filtering step here, or some kind of control on the data stream X test before it goes into prediction uh, to be able to, to control which predictions we are interested in. And in this way, the machine learning logic stays intact and there's just a, a kind of filter on X test which tells us which predictions we should be updating. Uh, what this means is that if we were to imagine that we start streaming a standard data set like the data in this data set of handwritten digits uh, with uh, new training data coming in with new test data uh, coming in live uh, the error rate of the uh, of the classifier used will uh, be reduced in time because as the training set gets larger uh, the, the error rate will will drop up to up until it drops to the theoretical level for, for the given classifier in this case about five percent uh, however pathway unless of course we tell it not to but by default pathway will be reclassifying um, updating decisions for uh, the test elements which came early on in the stream which means that at the end of the day if you look at the outcomes the table of outcomes of the table of uh, classification decisions made by pathway the error rate will be uh, consistently low uh, for all of the uh, of the classified elements. So uh, the ability to revisit decisions, revise decisions uh, as the model improves uh, leads to a significant gain with respect to just ad hoc decisions like you only live once and you don't uh, go back on the data. A quick code primer for those of you uh, who've, who've taken a, a shine to this approach. Uh, in pathway tables, think of tables, think of data frames, we call them tables, are at the heart of everything. Uh, you can create a table uh, by um, like from a static data source. In this case, it'll be static forever. In this case, we took a table uh, just for out of the string written in Markdown. Uh, or you can uh, make uh, a table out of the stream connector. Uh, so you can connect in the simplest case uh, to a directory of CSV files, uh, to, to a CSV file, uh, which is updated over uh, time. And as uh, this uh, streaming source is updated, as the, the input file uh, is updated, uh, the table in pathway is updated and all the machinery is updated. So this is something that uh, that can connect to, uh, to file data sources in S3. It can connect to Kafka and other data sources. So uh, on top of tables, we can run uh, table operations. For example, we may want to take our table, in this case, it was a table of dogs with known age and just filter out all the dogs uh, whose age is at most 10. And uh, we can preview the outcome for static data. And if we were do, to do this in streaming mode, uh, table dog youngs would, would also automatically update in streaming mode. Um, a slightly more operation is to do a join. In this case, we can join in a simple way dogs with their owners, but there are many, many more advanced um, joins supported by Pathway. And uh, most interestingly, we can do functions on uh, tables. Uh, let's suppose uh, we would want to uh, correct the dog's age by um, subtracting one from it, we can uh, make a map on, on rows using an apply function uh, and get a table which is, uh, which is appropriately, revised, uh, appropriately revised and appropriately updated in real time. A more interesting and harder case, uh, which we inv invite you to look at, uh, is, is transformer classes, which are much more expressive and allow us to define uh, logic, which is much more powerful than just a simple uh, lambda type transformation. It's logic which involves pointers to other rows and potentially pointers to other tables. So um, if you uh, think about building, if you uh, think about building a solution, a pipeline uh, in, in Pathway, um, the pipeline is composed of uh, little building blocks. Uh, they're like the, the orange ones uh, here that are called transformers and which transform uh, tables into tables, some tables, input tables into output tables. Um, if you take a data engineering perspective, then this type of pipeline uh, could make operations like filtering 
structuring tables, joining tables, doing a group by or group by reduce, uh, doing some kind of sorting or scanning by sorted index, etc. Now, if we want to do go beyond the data engineering and uh, go for machine learning, then Pathway um, makes it possible to use what I would call a drop-in replacement, a smart replacement uh, for a filter operation, which is like machine learning powered. So you can have a machine learning filter, which we call a smart filter. A join could be replaced, for example, by a fuzzy join, a fuzzy matching, a group by, by a clustering or classification operation, which also groups somehow the rows of the table, a sorted index by a machine learning ranking, et cetera. And uh, you can build pipelines of machine learning operations which update like this. So you can make your own transformers using row pointers, row centric logic as well, um, building and traversing lists and graphs. Uh, interestingly, you can make loops, for example, to make things iterate until convergence and write compositional logic. Uh, there's a pathway examples repo, which, which is fully runnable, which, way you, which you can test on Colab, for example, where you can run a lot of tutorial notebooks, uh, which we make available. Now for a quick demo, we've prepared an application which does real-time Twitter sentiment analysis with Pathway, uh, with uh, geolocated tweets uh, to figure out at which geographical location as a given topic is trending in a positive sense and which it's trending in a negative sense. The application architecture, which, which we are sharing with you, which we invite you to get it uh, from our GitHub uh, repo for a direct link, uh, which is runnable with Docker Composers presented here. Uh, Pathway takes in a real-time stream of tweets collected via Tweetly, um, then uh, the, runs it uh, through logic within Pathway, which I'll present to you in a minute, uh, which makes use of uh, Python libraries, which are just called like that in Pathway, uh, connects uh, through an output connector to send uh, its results out uh, to a front end, which visualizes the results. And these results get updated in streaming mode uh, live um, on the way, there's also like a storage and API layer, which allows us to put together the pieces. So if you just allow me to do a brief demonstration, I will move on to presenting my entire screen. If you um, move into uh, our, our GitHub repo, uh, you'll see that for the application is, is all there. It comes with a number of Docker composers. I will show you how to do a Docker uh, replay uh, of um, uh, some, some data that we uh, collected uh, after music video awards, but it's also possible to achieve uh, the same uh, with a different doc composer which we also provide with live Twitter data. So what I'm showing you now is a streaming replay uh, of tweets that happened in the past, but if you want to connect to Twitter live to a given topic, it's easy to set up, we need to set up and run with Docker Compose in the same way. So we do a Docker Compose, um, waiting for it to, to get up. I will move to my browser window, um, wait a second for, for it to come up. And the, the, as the live replay uh, proceeds, we will soon be getting our first tweets. This um, is hello, Adrian. Coming in. Yeah, yes. We are wrapping up. We have around four minutes. Sorry. Perfect. Perfect. That's just perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, uh, the, then uh, the, the, the tweets are coming in, in in simulated real time. In fact, we have a speed up factor of 50. And as they come in, uh, you see the green and violet circles, which represent positive and negative sentiment. These circles update as the total uh, number of tweets increases. We're processing uh, about um, uh, several thousand tweets every second. Uh, and uh, and you see that, uh, that the sentiment changes. In this case, we are looking at uh, predictors of influence of a given tweet. Uh, for example, we have some uh, negative feedback here from Detroit after Eminem's performance, which apparently was quite controversial. Um, just to uh, wrap up, uh, the interesting things that are going on inside the pipeline and pathway, there's pre-processing with filtering joins and a call to an external API placeholder. There's um, 
iterative uh, geolocation cleaning go going inside in pathway because the the locations that we we uh, get um, have some errors with text like turn on notifications placed instead of a place name we use an iterative process to actually figure out which place names are kind of suspect we use a bit of geography and uh, use the intellect interlinked um, graph data uh, from from the from the graph of interconnected tweets to figure out which locations are suspect and we clear them out. Uh, then we do sentiment analysis with text blob and compute influence. Uh, in fact, uh, going beyond uh, a simple um, pred predict, uh, pred simple uh, influence measure just to get a predictor of which tweets are likely to create a significant buzz before this actually happens. And the size of the circles which I was showing you in the demo are a measure of just that. So. Uh, the main takeaway, um, streaming life had some pains in store for us. There was no time for a coffee. However, if you go for pathway, if we go for having our little pause, PWs pause in our code, uh, we let you let pathway handle live data updates for you and things get easier. Your code uh, is basically what it was uh, in the batch sense, just with things on, in streaming and at scale. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have a chance to, to premiere with Pathways Open Beta. Uh, it would be a pleasure to have you part of Pathways community. Join us uh, on our website, join us on Discord, we're there. Um, so many, many thanks for, from the whole team for having us and don't hesitate to run examples, experiment, have fun with Pathway and let us know what you think. Thank you very much. Um, we can have a quick question. Uh, it, I take it only specific L algorithms are supported for Pathway? So Pathway allows you to create your own algorithms uh, and write them in Pathway. Uh, the class uh, transformer transformer class syntax allows you to express a lot of things, time series, graph algorithms, things like um, you'll f find things like uh, like PageRank or Bellman Ford and other graph search algorithms in our in our library. But essentially. Uh, Anything that that would work fast as a distributed algorithm will work fast in Pathway. You implement it in Pathway, and it it'll run. So anything is supported. Things that distribute well, uh, that will run well in a distributed architecture, will also most likely be running fast in Pathway. Thank you very much, uh, and we will conclude here. Thank you for your time. Um, Thank you. Looking forward to more questions in Discord. Thanks so much.